Welcome to the Friday Forum. Our presentation, A Tale of Three Spouses, Partners in Leadership. Today's presentation is being recorded. You can view it in two separate ways, on the Renaissance Society Forum YouTube channel or from the Renaissance website. If you have a question, and we do welcome questions today, please use the bottom button to open the Q&A, type in your question and hit send. Questions will be answered throughout the presentation. The chat is disabled. Closed captioning is available. If you'd like to turn it on or off, use the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen to either show or hide the subtitles. You can also change the font size using the same settings button. And now I'm excited for today's forum, A Tale of Three Spouses, Partners, partners in Leadership. Today, we are delighted to have three wonderful participants. Jody Nelson, spouse of the CSUS President Robert Nelson, Julie Steinberg, spouse of Major, Mayor Daryl Steinberg, and Marcos Kunalakis, spouse of Lieutenant Governor Elena Kunalakis. The moderator of today's forum is Beth Ruyak. Welcome, Beth. Hi there, Lori. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the presentation. So Beth is a four Emmy Award winning journalist whose career started in news 40 years ago. She is a former host of Inside on Cap Radio and is currently a graduate student in the master's program at Sac State studying, studying modern media social narratives with a goal of more documentary filmmaking. She is standing by to start our program. So welcome, Beth. Thanks a lot, Lori. Welcome to all of you. And thank you to the Renaissance Society for putting together, wouldn't you say, such a very interesting forum today. I am Beth Ruiak. I will be guiding the conversation, but I'd really like to work in your voice. So as Lori said, type your questions into the Q&A and I'll try to work them in throughout the hour. We probably won't get to all of them, but we will be able to hear from some of you. And now it is my pleasure to welcome our panelists to A Tale of Three Spouses, Partnership in Leadership. So hello, everybody. There's Jody Nelson. Hi, Jody. Hi, Beth. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Julie Steinberg is with us. Hi, Julie. Hi, Beth. Hey, Jody. And hey, Marcos. Marcos Kunalakis joining us as well. Hi, Marcos. Glad to have you too. Hello to everyone. Okay, I, Marcos, I'm going to start with you because I, I don't want to be rude, so I should properly introduce you as the second partner of California, married to our California Lieutenant Governor, who is also the former ambassador to Hungary. Are you ever called like Mr. Lieutenant Governor or? <laughs> it's funny, I used to be called Mr. Ambassador, which, yes. uh, but uh, in as you know, Jen Newsom has taken over this title of first partner, so I am second partner. But if you go to the Wikipedia page, I'm second gentleman. What distinguishes me is I'm the first second gentleman. Ah, that's right. Although with Vice President Kamala Harris, we have another second gentleman. So this is so interesting, isn't it? How we have spouses, husbands, wives, um, all in the political field in different roles. Indeed, indeed. And Doug and I share this title of first or second gentleman, him of the United States, and I of the state of California. Hmm. So, um, Ms. Nelson, I'm going to go to you. Um, first lady of Sacramento State, what about that title? Yeah, it's a bit much. <laughs> it makes me a little bit uncomfortable, but people seem to like to use it. And so I've kind of gone with it. Are you ever like Mrs president or are there ever any odd versions of that title? Well, you know, uh, when Robert was president of UT Pan American, they give the spouses an official title in the HR system. Hmm. And so that official title, and they put it on my business card, was special assistant to the president. <laughs> Oh, my. That okay. was a little bit odd. I, I better be special, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Julie, that's a perfect segue to, I guess you would be special assistant to the mayor of Sacramento. Your title actually is Cantor Julie Steinberg. Do people call you more often that, or are you ever first lady of Sacramento? Oh, you know, I'm all kinds of things, Beth. <laughs> I think generally people call me Julie. Um, in professionally, they call me Cantor. And to me, really what's important is that Daryl always recognize that I'm always the first lady of whatever he is doing <laughs> and, and treat me accordingly. <laughs> there we go. And with that, Julie, do you wanna share a little tidbit of your life together, you, you and the mayor, the Cantor and the mayor? Sounds like a book, doesn't it? Or a movie? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Can I steal that? And You're living it. <laughs> I'll use it as a title. The mayor and me. Um, well, I'll tell you, when I first met Daryl, um, it's a little cliche, but, he, you know, he said, and I knew it would not be boring. And uh, life has not been boring. We are coming up on 30 years together. Um, and every single experience has been a good ride. It's interesting. And it's, um, Daryl's always fun to be with. And I'm always really proud of him. If anybody had told me I'd be married to a politician, I don't know that I would have believed that that could be possible. I didn't marry a politician. I married, I married a lawyer. Um, but I'm always so proud of him. It's really nice that one of the things that we never argue about is politics or points of view or values are completely aligned. So it's, that's nice. It feels like we journey this path together. There are plenty of other things that we can find um, separate preferences on, not to mention what's for dinner. But Marcos, let's go, let's go to you for a tidbit about your life. Um, has it been as smooth and easy as Julie's, as fun as all of that storybook story is? Well, it's a lovely story that, uh, that Julie and, and, and Daryl have. And, and uh, I too have to say that it's something important that we both have come from a place where we have shared values and shared experiences. Uh, both Eleni and I um, come from families of refugees. Both my parents came as refugees from, uh, from Greece, as did her father, Angelo. And um, we also shared this reality that uh, both of my grandmothers and one of her grandmothers never learned to read and write. So they were both illiterate. And so we come from a, a, a place that, that where we understand each other. Uh, the one tidbit I was going to share, however, is, uh, you know, when she was ambassador, I, I nearly created an international incident when uh, we were both, um, there was an organization called the Diplomatic Spouses Budapest. And so I felt welcome and I was invited to come and attend. And I had told my friend, uh, the Israeli ambassador's husband to come with me. So we went to this, what was up until then, a, a dominantly uh, woman, uh, woman run and, uh, and membership was entirely women uh, organization. Uh, that was great. We were welcomed. It was a wonderful event. The next meeting, however, found that the diplomatic spouses Budapest had split between the Muslim spouses and those who were more welcoming of the American and the Israeli ambassadors spouses. Mm -hmm. So uh, it didn't boil over into an international incident, but it certainly was a, a, a tempest in the teapot of Budapest. Walking this life can be tricky, can't it, Jody? Will you share something, some little tidbit from your life? Certainly, you know, I was only 19 when I married Robert. He was 23, so very young. It's been 46 years and it's been quite a ride, up and down, good and bad, but we've stuck together through all of it. Um, yeah, when he first became uh, president, we had to learn to do this new dance together, if you will. And Robert is really good at working a room. And so I would be at his side, trying to work the room with him and meet all these new people, especially when we were new. <clears throat> but he's really bad about 
turning to talk to someone else, then I'm behind him. He forgets about me. He doesn't introduce me. So we had several conversations about this. It never got better. So I learned that I just have to work the room on myself, by myself, and it works better for both of us. Well, 46 years, congratulations. And Marcos, you and your wife might have a different sort of record. How long after meeting did you get married? It was uh, eight weeks after we met. Uh, but when I'm asked how long we dated, I said we dated for years, just not each other. <laughs> eight weeks. Was that um, sudden perfect fit or clock is ticking and you look wonderful. Let's start a family. <laughs> <laughs> you know when you know, and we both understood, as I say, we shared values and we just knew that once we met each other, this was meant to be. Okay, Julie, I have permission to ask you this question. What has kept you and your husband together for 30 years? How do you stay together? Well, we don't leave. We <laughs> stay together. And I, I have to say, Daryl is very funny. And he keeps me laughing all the time. Family is important to both of us. We are, um, we are connected in a way that goes back through my parents, his parents. We have a long history together. So it almost feels like uh, we, were in, we were destined to be together. So I think everyone would enjoy hearing a little bit more of each of your backgrounds. Jody, let me start with you. And can I take you all the way back to high school just to get a feel of what kind of teenager you were and what were you interested in? Wow, that's some years ago. Um, well, I was more into socializing than academics when I was in high school. And so I did not excel. I have a twin brother. And he always got straight A's. And my parents were always asking why I wasn't getting straight A's. And I said, it's because I'm having too much fun. And uh, the things I enjoyed in high school were, were the arts, um, dance, symphony orchestra, acapella choir, drama, all of those things. That's what I enjoyed. Isn't that interesting that he got the straight A's, but you married the president of the yes. university. <laughs> um, you went to college and then you earned your MBA at University of Texas, Dallas. When did you meet your husband? What was going on in your life then? Well, like I said, I was just 19 and um, it was during the summer after my freshman year, Robert and I were at the same college but hadn't met. Um, he was actually working at a clothing and sporting goods store with my sister and he asked her out on a date. And she showed him her, she said, I am engaged to be married. <laughs> and he's, so his recovery line was, well, do you have a little sister? And she said, well, actually I do. So then my sister called me and said, you've got to come in. There's a great sale on corduroy bell bottoms. Remember those? Yeah. And I came in and she introduced us and the rest is history. By the way, I hope Robert was wearing them because in my high school, all the cool guys wore corduroy bell bottoms. <laughs> um, I do, I'm taking a bit of a turn here, Jody, but in, in asking my next question, which is about the most significant thing that has happened to the two of you in your marriage, I, I also would like to acknowledge what day this is and what day yesterday was. And I say this with the deepest, um, compassion and respect. And again, I'll say that I know that you are fine with me asking you about this. I, I wouldn't go in um, unprepared with you in that way. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, the most significant thing in our marriage, unfortunately, has been the loss of our only child, our son, Seth. And when he was 25, he, he took his own life. And everything changed that day. Our lives were turned upside down. We really struggled. We both dealt with his death very differently. Um, a lot of marriages break up after something like that. And we did counseling, we did support groups. 
uh, we tried everything and just worked really, really hard just to hold on to each other. We just knew if we could get through this, that we could get through anything. Hmm. Well, I am going to ask you about two traits that have helped you in your marriage. And I suspect that one or both speak exactly to that challenge between the two of you. So what is it about you that you know has made a difference for your spouse? Well, I think, you know, I'm very um, empathetic, if you will, compassionate. We have a lot of similar passions, like for our students. And so that holds us together. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that I'm pretty easygoing, I'm flexible. Uh, Robert's a workaholic and he does not like taking vacations. He's just all about the work and I'm the opposite. So I've learned to be flexible and, and tolerate his schedule. And um, when I need to go on a vacation, I call up my girlfriends and I go and that's how we've learned to get along for all these years. Well, I again want to um, express the appreciation for your openness, you and your husband, about the situation with Seth and acknowledge um, with compassion his passing. And I'm especially thankful because that anniversary, I think it was 20 years yesterday, wasn't it? Yes. That, that, you, that you kept this commitment and that you're joining us today. Thank you, Jody. Absolutely. I'm happy to do it. And yes, Robert and I have always tried to be very open about this so that others could also come and speak with us. And they have. Students who lost a brother, uh, parents who lost a child, they come to us and talk to us and we're just so glad that we can help them in a small way. Well, if we were in a room full, I would say Jody Nelson and people would applaud right now. So let's just imagine that. And Julie, I'm gonna to turn to you next. And back in high school, you were studying music pretty seriously, weren't you? I did. I studied music. Um, and while I was in high school, I also studied with a teacher at the conservatory in San Francisco. And um, that kind of took me on my musical path. So in your academic path, it was San Francisco State, Indiana University, UC Berkeley, and you already alluded to the families and the connections, but tell me about meeting your husband and what your own thoughts were right away about him and, and any future. Uh, well, Daryl and I um, were... <laughs> were in some ways an arranged marriage <laughs> in that our mothers introduced us. Oh. Um, so I always tell young people, listen to your mother. She knows everything. Follow her advice. It's always good. I like um, that. Yes, it's important. Um, so our, my, my family knew Daryl's family in San Francisco. There's a, my mother went to high school with his mother. Her family um, shopped at my father-in-law's family's delicatessen, and my father was Daryl's first pediatrician. Wow. So we kind of go way back. But I will say that Daryl and I, Daryl called me up. I had just returned from living um, in Israel, and Daryl had called me up and said, do, do you want to go out? And I was like, oh, okay. And I met him in Berkeley. And when I walked down the street and I saw him, I, I sort of was taken aback because I, I thought it was his father. <laughs> he looked so much like his dad. I thought, oh, it's, it's Bud. <laughs> but it wasn't, it was Daryl. So, you know, we, we like to joke that we were set up and, um, Daryl likes to say that our, our mothers are still chaperoning our dates. Yeah. <laughs> well, everybody seems to be doing pretty well at this, but you too have had a significant challenge, um, both within your family and we witnessed outside of your family as 
the conflict and struggle in Sacramento, the protests came to your front yard this year. But let's go back to that interpersonal place um, with you, your husband, and your children, and the challenges you faced. You know, when you have kids, you have no idea what's ahead of you. I, I always said to Daryl at any difficult moment, I just wanted a baby. <laughs> that was as far as my mind went. I just wanted a baby. I had no idea what was in front of us. And like anything else in life, you stumble along until um, you find something that works and hopefully you stumble along together. I was very lucky that um, Daryl and I found ways to meet the challenges that we faced with our, with our kids um, and we, we faced them head on. Both of my children used to tell us that they would never speak to us again if we got divorced. So, <laughs> so I think they, they, um, they were very invested in our family staying together and working together. And, you know, I, I'm happy to say my children are grown now. So it's really been a wonderful thing to see that, um, you, you give your kids what you can, you hope that they take it in, and you send them out into the world and be their cheerleader. Your family too has been very open about, in particular, the struggles of your, your oldest, Jordana's um, mental illness, her challenges that she had, but she's living independently in LA, and your son, Ari, is in law school, is that right? Yes. So I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Jody. What traits do you think you brought to your family and your marriage in particular in being able to um, walk through the challenges, stay together and stay strong together? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. That's a hard one um, to see yourself in that light. Um, I think maybe the most important thing is that I am like glue. I stick and I don't give up. So whatever we have faced, um, I'm, I'm all in. Um, I think like Jody, I'm patient because yes, Daryl works a lot. I learned a long time ago that it, it would be better to just check in with Daryl's scheduler to find time with Daryl than to nag Daryl to look at his schedule. Um, and in all fairness to Daryl, to figure out his schedule was hard and continues to be hard. And I, I think, I think his, his scheduler is got got better information more up to date um i think as you go on in life together you find ways to be a team and once you get through this hardship or the next hardship your team connection grows and gets stronger i've been very very lucky that um you know that that daryl is similar in that sense we both stick. Well, you know, the truth is that people are very interested in your lives and your families because they have this belief that your family must be so different or is so much more unusual than theirs in some ways. So with that, Marcos, I'm going to move to you. And thank you, Julie. A applause and again, the recognition for your honesty. So back in high school, Marcos, at Lowell in San Francisco. What kind of a teenager were you? So as I said, I, I came from an immigrant family and so uh, and, and from one that did not really have the means uh, to sort of do many things. Uh, so I worked. I, uh, I worked in a grocery store. I worked in a gas station. I worked delivering pizza. So uh, whenever I wasn't uh, doing my after school job, I tried to engage in some after school sports. Uh, and then I had a passion for cars, fast cars, loud cars, uh, sharp, 
snappy looking cars. And of course I couldn't afford any of the cars. So I would always buy old clunkers and fix them up. And, um, and in fact, that's how I paid for a lot of my college over time was I would buy old cars, fix them up and sell them. And, you know, very, I, I miss some of those great cars. Uh, but, uh, one of them paid for my entire sophomore year at, at Berkeley. Wow, you were very entrepreneurial. In <laughs> fact, undergrad was at UC Berkeley. Then you had a master's in journalism from Columbia University, your PhD from Central European University in Budapest. You have worn so many hats, Marcos, from being an international graduate fellow to a foreign correspondent, an author, a broadcaster, a scholar. Sometimes, is it true that the jobs your wife has held limited perhaps what you wanted to do or what you could do professionally? Uh, well, very specifically, uh, they have. Uh, for instance, I was a foreign correspondent and worked in journalism. And up until recently, I was the foreign affairs columnist for the McClatchy chain of newspapers with my column uh, and my editor is down in Miami at the Miami Herald. But when we went to post uh, in Budapest, um, the State Department has very arcane and very strict rules as to what you can or cannot do. And uh, it, there was a department at the State Department, a section of the De State Department known as L, the legal department, that is we also refer to as the Department of No. Because every time I sent them a proposal of something I would do, whether it was something related to journalism or even not related to journalism, the, the, res the uh, response was invariably no. So uh, you mentioned my PhD. The one thing they said yes to was continuing education and academic uh, engagement. So um, even though neither Eleni, Eleni was the first person in her family to uh, graduate from a four-year college, I was the first one to go to college. Uh, so uh, the fact that I'm sitting here with a PhD at the end of my name is in part because the State Department says, no, you can't do certain things, but also because uh, we really, both she and I, ha just have such great respect for and, and an understanding of what education, higher education has done for our families. And so, I'm, you know, while I was upset that I couldn't do certain things, uh, it's all, the outcome has been really positive. I don't know whether that's a page from the TV show, Madam Secretary, or whether you would be your own episode, <laughs> but it's, it's certainly there. And that's certainly where her husband um, found his um, calling. Yeah, so he went, he went to Georgetown to teach theology and I'm yeah. down at the Hoover Institution in, which is, you know, a considered a little more conservative than the democratic politics that uh, Eleni and Daryl and others uh, in the state of California pursue, but I, I remain nonpartisan uh, and, and enjoy it. Tell me about a significant um, challenge or situation within your family, within your marriage. Uh, well, you know, I'd say, and this is probably true for many families, you know, who've experienced this. My, my mother went through a long demise with, um, with Alzheimer's and um, anyone who's been through that knows the, the long goodbye is so painful. And uh, at various points, uh, my parents were living with us and, you know, Eleni had embraced my family the same way that I've embraced hers. And, and so um, the challenges of, of sort of walking through this deterioration of a human being who was so vibrant and lively and, and, uh, and then to uh, walk them and hold their hand through to death is, um, you know, it's a, it's a tough thing. Well, again, I express my compassion and there's nothing like losing a family member, whatever place that family member holds in your life and your heart, it's incomparable and it changes you forevermore and certainly losing a parent does. Yeah. yeah. Well, what she was great. Eleni was great through all of it. She, she really uh, was very solid and supportive. What traits same question, do you have that you think make a difference to your wife, to your marriage? 
So when when we met, I, I let her know as a foreign correspondent and someone who'd been a war correspondent that there is nobody better to have by your side than me during a crisis. Uh, I just happen to have been trained to find calm within any storm and know exactly where the exits are. Uh, and it's a very important trait. Certainly when she became ambassador, uh, it's funny, when we used to date, I would never, I was the one who would never allow my back to be at the front door or, or a window. And, mm -hmm. um, and she thought that was sort of an odd thing, but you know, it was part of my survival training as, uh, and being all these, in these countries and being in various wars. Well, when she went through uh, training at the State Department and as and holding the position of ambassador, she was required to be the one not facing the door. <laughs> and so suddenly I was the one with my back at the door because of the State Department rules. And I would sit down and I say, you've got my back, right? And so <laughs> she'd say yes. So the first thing is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really good to be with in a crisis. And I'd say, um, the second thing is uh, because of our backgrounds and, and sort of the values that we hold, I, I think I bring perspective, you know, nothing can ever be so bad, <laughs> you know, that we cannot survive it. And, um, and I think that's an important trait, you know, I, I really admire uh, both Beth and, and, and I'm sorry, both uh, Jody and, and uh, Julie for saying that they're, you know, that they bring resilience and compassion and understanding and and I try to do that as well, but I but I think more than that for me, it's it's uh, being able to bring the perspective of someone who's been in the field where people have been in in war environments where people have died, and so I know that things just cannot be much worse than that whenever I'm in any situation. Well. I, again, appreciate the background on all three of you. Let's move through some quick questions and get some other dimensions. Um, these couple are going to be a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Okay. All right. So do you attend many events with your spouse? Thumbs up for yes or thumbs down? Jody's a yes. Julie's a no. Marco says a yes. <laughs> I can tell by the pictures, Julie, that you're not there a lot. Does your spouse attend many of your events? Thumbs up for a yes, thumbs down for a no. Yes, yes. Oh, we got a little middle for Julie here, but Marcos is a definite yes. Okay, how about this one? Do you like attending public events? You yourself, thumbs up or thumbs down? Oh, you all do. Oh, that's great. Okay. Um, I do have a couple questions we're gonna get to from our attendees. Here's one for you, Jody. Someone is observing the yin and yang design on your necklace and earrings. What is the significance of that to you? So I also have uh, the tattoo on my wrist along with the semicolon, which is a sign for um, suicide prevention. Uh, my son, when he was 16, he was into karate and eventually did get his black belt. And one time I came home after work and he had gotten from home from school and with a friend, they had painted a huge, I mean, to the ceiling all the way down to the floor, yin and yang symbol on his bedroom wall in red and black. And I was not happy about it. <laughs> but that symbolism of there's light in the darkness and there's darkness in the light and all that that means has come to mean a lot to me uh, after his passing. Hmm. Another question from an attendee. Someone heard me say author about you, Marcos. So would you talk about your book or, or books? So uh, it's been a number of books. Uh, I've got one coming out in the fall with Anthem Press called uh, Freedom Isn't Free, The Cost of uh, World Order. And it's a collection of my columns from the last nearly decade. Uh, my first book was uh, I spent a year inside of Apple Computer and that one's called Defying Gravity. I uh, documented and, and uh, spent time with the leadership and the engineers and the marketing team uh, as they developed a technology called Newton which in many ways, if you have an iPhone, is sort of a, a larger version and a version 1.0 of what the iPhone is today. 
Uh, and then I've done a series of books since then, one on business uh, when I worked at Silicon Graphics on communications within an organization, it's still being used in universities. Uh, and the last book that I did, uh, there's a few books there in between, but the last book I did uh, is called um, Spin Wars and Spy Games. Uh, it's about global media intelligence in uh, and uh, how basically other states use um, their media organizations as intelligence gathering spying operations. I think I could establish that your overarching um, job is as a political scientist. And yes. I, you did write a column for McClatchy about spouses, and I'm going to pull a line from it here. You wrote, the public too should wake up and prepare for a new category of men who will accompany and support these freshly elected women. So do you know how big the club is of um, political spouses at, I, I would say, state or higher levels who are men as opposed to the women? Well, I mean, it's easy to basically figure out that number, just count how many women there are, you know, and, and you'll and they're and more well, than likely to be with uh, men um, as as spouses. But I don't know what the absolute number. I remember when I, I saw Bill Clinton once and he referred to himself as the first laddie. If he were going to be the uh, if he were going to be uh, married to the president of the United States uh, here in San Francisco, where I'm sitting right now, um, there are two prominent ones. In fact, they were on the podium when Barack Obama was inaugurated as president of the United States. And it's Paul Pelosi and Richard Blum. Richard is married to Dianne Feinstein. Of course, Paul is married to the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. So um, at least within the radius of my home, uh, you know, I can I can throw a rock and hit a few. Speaking of books, by the way, I can't help but quote and this was again in your column, what your wife wrote in her book titled, you're gonna love this, Madam Ambassador. It was her memoir, but she wrote, Marcos was a great father, but a so-so mother. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, <laughs> what can I say? She's right. <laughs> oh, you gotta say, honey, we gotta talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, the good news is I ha we, we have two boys, and so I could teach them not necessarily soft skills, but uh, but the hard skills. You know, I think I, I've got two sons who could go into war corresponding, but uh, aren't that great at, at sort of the stuff that really needs to get done at home. They are sloppy, messy teenagers right now, and, uh, and say, I'll take all the blame for that. <laughs> they're still at home. You're still in the midst of it. Julie, let me ask you, how much is entering into a campaign or deciding to run for office a family decision in your home? And certainly there have been a lot of offices, a lot of campaigns. Completely. It is, it is completely a family experience. Um, how can it not be? Uh, when Daryl first ran for city council, we were basically newlyweds. We hadn't even been married a year. And he found out that the seat it was a Thursday night. And he found out that the seat was open because Kim Mueller was going to go to law school. And um, she called. And I remember he got off the phone and he said, should, should I run? And I was young and had no idea what I was talking about. And I said, sure. So it started as a family affair. And we ran that campaign, we were very much together through it. And ever since then. So, you know, we would walk pre precincts together. I would go to meetings together. And of course, you know, we talk about everything. And once the kids came along, um, it, that's their life. So they become, they become very involved. So I'm going to twist a question a little bit from an attendee, and that is about um, your husband's commitment to homelessness in the city and the housing insecure. How much does he rely on or discuss with you where he is or what he does on the issues? We talk about everything. Um, he runs ideas by me. Sometimes I run ideas by him. Um, you know, we become, we are, we are a, uh, an interdependent force, I guess you could say. 
that's part of that's part of being married, um, whatever your spouse does professionally. Um, that the you, my former life, I was a social worker, so um, the the housing, the homeless issue is near and dear to both of our hearts, and um, I will say that Daryl is one of the most creative thinkers. I've ever met. He has the ability to um, see past the typical and find ways to have solutions. Um, I think sometimes the, the way the system works can be very frustrating because he can see from point A all the way down the alphabet. Um, but Daryl is committed, as I am, to making this world a better place and to uh, finding ways to support, the, to support people who are without a home. So that was actually a question that came from Tom Sukonic and his wife, Cindy. And I, I want to ask each of you, Jody and Marcos, the same thing, to what degree your spouses rely on your input on issues and, and your advice. Jody, how does that happen at the university? Well, you know, my career was also in higher ed administration. So I was the executive vice president for finance and administration at two campuses. And so Robert will often discuss the financial side, the budget side, all of those things with me, and we'll sit down and look at them together. And I usually don't have answers for him, but I know the right questions to ask. So I'll look at a spreadsheet and I'll say, well, I think you should ask this question or you should ask that question. So I think I'm helpful to him in that way. And other than that, it's really you know him coming home and kind of doing a brain dump, if you will, of, of his day and letting go of all of that. Um, and me, you know, listening and just, just listening and being sympathetic to the stresses of the day. Marcos? Uh, well, it's very specific, in fact, uh, because um, the governor, Gavin Newsom, uh, appointed my wife to essentially be uh, California's top diplomat when he gave her the portfolio for international relations and trade. And that really is my specialty, uh, is, is all things international. And I'm a foreign affairs analyst. And so it's really great fun because I'm looking at things that she's not looking at on a regular basis. So I consider myself an analyst, but she's a practitioner. And so this was also true when we were in Hungary. I'm able to look at things a little bit differently. I read things that, that she doesn't. Uh, and yet we're able to mix it up and, and sort of find ways forward. Um, another part of her role, and this touches on Jody's life, is that she's a, uh, Eleni is the, on the trustees for the CSUs, uh, for this, all the California State University. She's a regent at, uh, in, at all the UCs, and she now sits on the board for the community colleges. And since my day-to-day -day is on a university campus, I'm able to provide sort of ground ground truth and uh, and grassroots level research on on uh, what it's like to interact with a, an academic senate or or students and give that feedback to her so so those two very specific ways i'd say there's a third one which is every once in a while she run her speeches by me and since i for a while held that job uh in uh, the silicon valley i uh i can interject some pretty good lines into her her writing, but she's she does all of her speeches otherwise. That goes with the territory as a spouse, doesn't it? Very as a writer. <laughs> um, and being a writer. Julie, we've been hearing a little more about everybody's life. I don't want to assume that people know that as the cantor at Bene Israel, and you have been there 30 years, I think, 30 years at the temple. There, are, there are times when you um, will lead the congregation, but sometimes you've involved your husband in that too, haven't you? <laughs> yes. So as I have not been the cantor for almost 30 years, but I have worked at the temple um, 
in addition to other things for in some capacity or another. Now I'm full time as the cantor, which is one half of the clergy. So we have the rabbi, we have the cantor. And uh, when the, the rabbi and I love to um, lead services together, um, but we both need a break once in a while. So she'll be on vacation. And there was a time during this pandemic um, you know, we were trying to bring something good into people's homes um, and bring a connection that, you, you know, we're, we're so separate. We can't be together. So there was a night where I was going to be leading services by myself, which generally is not a problem. But I thought it might be fun for people if Daryl led services with me. So um, he, you know, he, I, I, made out an order of service so he'd know what what came next and what to do. And he read some things and we got to interact um, because Shabbat, our Sabbath services are joyful and they're they're meant to create community. And it was it was just pure fun to have Daryl um, sharing the Bema with me and to bring that into people's homes. We had a great time together. There is a request from each of you for another funny moment from your life. And before we do that, I want to do another thumbs up, thumbs down. Did I, um, did I ask you if you enjoy the role that you have in your marriage in this very public life? I'm not sure that I did. So um, let's, let's see with some either, you know, big enthusiasm or not, or middle, what about living this life that you do, this very public life with your spouse? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay, and you're all smiling too. So I'm gonna trust that that's a very real answer. Now to something funny. Jody, did something come to your mind? Oh gosh, I'm trying to think. Um, you know, I have well, to admit- how about, how about what you were told in terms of being a university president when you were oh. in Texas? Okay, yes. When Robert was selected to be the next president of UT Pan American, we came and we met with the outgoing uh, president and his wife. And she had been a very, very involved president spouse. And she kind of gave me this little lecture about how, you know, you know, Jody. In this role, you can never go out without your makeup on, your hair done, your clothes just so, you've got to look the part all the time. And I thanked her for the advice, but internally I'm thinking that is not me. You know, <laughs> I put on my workout clothes, I pull my hair back for all they know, I've just been to the gym and that's how I live. <laughs> because that's you. What about you, Marcos, another funny moment? Uh, well, actually, it goes back to you as I, as you know, we didn't know each other very well at the very beginning. It was eight weeks. Uh, and so one of uh, the first dates, I didn't realize, but in retrospect, I guess it was a test. I uh, came roaring up to her apartment here. She had a place in San Francisco on the weekends. And so I came roaring up on my motorcycle, all clad in leather and, you know, with my helmet and looking pretty mean. And, um, and I, 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 I saw her and the first thing that came out of her mind is, do you have a second helmet? And I thought, okay, this is gonna work out just fine. Um, we weren't gonna go anywhere. We were just gonna meet and go walk for a walk. But you know, that was definitely a positive moment and I think uh, may have cinched the deal. That was a good answer, I think. Julie, what about you, a funny moment? I have to tell this, this is my favorite funny story for Daryl. Daryl won the um, Profiles and Courage Award and we went out to Boston. And one of the things that we did before the ceremony was we had brunch with the other people who had won and with Caroline Kennedy and her husband and a small group of people. And they asked, "Does it, do you tell us something about your spouse that we don't know? And um, I told about Daryl and my first date. So Daryl and I went, um, we met in Berkeley and we hit it off. We walked up to the, um, 
Claremont Hotel and stood on the balcony. I don't know. Marcos, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, you're looking out over the sparkling lights of the San Francisco Bay. And it was really quite romantic. And I, I just thought, I really like this guy. And we were talking and I was thinking, oh, is, is he going to kiss me? And suddenly, Daryl breaks out into a Robert Kennedy speech, complete with accent. And he, and, he, and he keeps going and he keeps going. So I told this story to Caroline Kennedy, wow. <laughs> my husband, on our first date. And they were, well, it is funny. They were laughing and their questions were, one, did he kiss you? And two, you went out with him again? So, <laughs> yes, I, and I discovered at that moment that if you really like somebody, yeah, whatever they're doing, it's kind of cute. So, yes, well, I got a, a, an earful of Robert Kennedy on our first what? date. foreshadowing what your life would be, but <laughs> did, he, did he kiss you? No, he did no. not. No, oh, no. My goodness. But no worries, he has since then. Okay, so he was giving a speech to lessen his anxiety. I get it. <laughs> he, was giving, he was giving a speech because he thought it was such a fabulous speech and he wanted to share it with me. <laughs> wow. Okay, let's do some real quick lightning rounds here. Just to answer, um, what do the two of you do? This is actually an attendee question. Chris, I think, asked it. What do the two of you do for pleasure that is the thing you like doing together. No long explanation, just something quick. Marcos? Hike. Hike. Julie? Out to dinner. Okay. Jody? Listening to Johnny Cash. Ah, okay. Um, biggest challenge in daily life? Um, wide open for whatever that is, just a word or two. All right, Julie, you're on that one. What's your answer? Time. Time. Mm, good answer. Jody. Just the stress that he's under. It's hard for me to see that. Hmm. Marcos. Scheduling and dinner. <laughs> As in cooking or finding ways to have it? Finding food in the house. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyone who needs to send you a gift knows which avenue to go to. Um, can you fit your own passions? This is a thumbs up or thumbs down into the life you have. And this is again from Tom and Cindy. Can you fit them in? Yes or no? I still ride my motorcycle. <laughs> okay. Have you had to give up something because of the kind of life you had in the public life? Thumbs up is a yes, thumbs down is a no. Oh, Marcos, no. Hmm. Jody, quickly, what was it you've had to give up? Well, I retired earlier than I probably would have to join him and support him in his president's role. Okay, Julie? Not so much now that our kids are grown, but when our kids were young, I was the, I was the mom. You had to stay flexible. I was the flexible one, yes, completely. Okay. Um, has this marriage been a significant influence on you, yes or no, because the other side of it would be, you've just rolled along with it and it's just been a good partnership or has it been a significant influence? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs up. Oh yeah, everybody on that. Okay, a uh, real quick answer from each of you. What is the most adventurous thing you yourself have done. And Marcos, you can't say marry a woman eight weeks after meeting her. <laughs> okay. But Marcos, you get to start. Uh, uh, boy, you know, as I said, I've, I've been a war correspondent. So yeah. uh, I, again, with my perspective, not a whole lot more gets adventurous than that. Yeah. Your life was in every decision you made in so many ways. Okay. Julie, what about you? Well, outside of marrying Daryl, um, I lived <laughs> I lived in Israel and uh, found work and lived on, in a foreign language um, and 
yes. found a way to support myself and extremely, move forward in that way. Extremely adventurous and courageous. Jody, what about you? I repelled off of the 16th story of the Marriott downtown to raise funds for foster youth. Yay. And then when they asked you the next year, what did you say? I said, yes, I did it did twice. It again. <laughs> wow. We have a very brave bunch. Okay. So we're going to wrap this up with um, a couple. I, I told you I'd like to hear from each of you about your own personal motto, prayer, or mantra in your life and how you roll that into your marriage. So Jody, you want to start? Sure. I, I guess the mantra, it's an adventure because I use that when things aren't going right, when I'm stressed or when something really fun is happening or exciting. So it motivates me for the good and the bad. It's an adventure. That kind of speaks for itself. On to you, Marcos. Uh, it's actually a mantra I borrowed from my dad and which I made my, made my kids memorize. It's fear nothing. It really is, uh, that's the one thing that we try to, uh, you know, make sure that we, we don't let infect our decision-making is fear. Hmm. And Julie, what about you? A great question. I don't know if I've ever thought about a mantra. I think that something that guides me is the idea that, that the details are not important. What's important is the fact that we're together and that I'm very lucky to have Daryl in my life. I can't let two, maybe three of you go without asking a question. Um, Julie, about a third term as mayor or higher office for your husband, what's your opinion? You know, I let Daryl take the lead in deciding or choosing what he wants to pursue. So I just go with it and see where we're going. Okay, Jody, is there a bigger career job out there that your husband talks about? No, not really. He loves being a president and uh, he'd probably do it till he died at his desk. Oh. <laughs> And Marcos, the bigger job would be governor of California. What about that for your spouse? Well, first of all, she's an accidental politician. So uh, this really just came out of the fact that, you know, Hillary Clinton had lost and encouraged women everywhere to run. And so she threw her hat in the ring. So right now, uh, what she's focused on is re-election uh, for lieutenant governor. And uh, she loves the public service. So the fact that the last out of the last four governors to have been lieutenant governors means that maybe she should be thinking about it. Yeah, you might want to have that conversation over dinner if you can find it. So, <laughs> all right, last one. This is your final question and your final thumbs up or thumbs down. Will each of your spouses be okay with everything you have said today in this forum? Oh, good. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> All right. Thank you to all of you. The First Lady of Sacramento State, Jody Nelson. Thank you so much, Jody. The second partner of California, Dr. Marcos Kunalakis. Thank you so much, Marcos. And Cantor Julie Steinberg. Julie, thank you to you as well. Thank you, Beth. I'm Beth Ruyak. Thanks to the Renaissance Society and to all of you. And this has been a tale of three spouses, partners in leadership. Take care and be well. And Beth, we all want to thank you. This has been a marvelous presentation. Um, we had a comment that uh, I've copied so I can share it with you about one of our attendees saying this is the best forum she's attended this year for sure. And I have to say that the time just flew by. I mean, it seemed like it was a 15 minute forum. So, and I mean, just excellent uh, questions. We appreciate everyone participating. Um, and what the Renaissance Society does, and I think that um, the conversation that you had with Julie makes this, or Jody, makes this even more special, is that um, each time we make a donation of $25 to the Seth Nelson Student Emergency Grant Fund as a token of our appreciation. And so I guess I, maybe this is a, another call out to our members. Um, this fund assists students who experience a financial emergency 
or unanticipated expenses. And certainly um, right now with, uh, you know, jobs being, you know, not as plentiful because of COVID, you know, people could use all the extra help. So if you, uh, if you feel like it, um, please, you know, contribute to that. And it's always goes to a good use. Well, Lori, thank you to everybody. And I must say the fact that you had these three guests really made this a magical hour for all of us, me included. And I thank you so much for the privilege of being the one who could um, navigate this conversation with them. Thank you all so very much. Wonderful. Thank you. So we do have a very exciting presentation coming up next. Oh, I, I'm sorry, today's presentation was recorded and you can view it in two separate ways on the Renaissance Society Forum channel on YouTube and from the Renaissance website. And then next forum uh, is Heather Fargo. I mean, we're all familiar with, with her as a previous mayor and she's gonna talk about accepting and adopting to your disabilities. So I wanna thank everyone for attending and I hope you have a wonderful week and we'll see you next Friday.